Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of the Minecraft Disney Q&A. This is the series in which you guys ask me all sorts of questions regarding anything Disney-related, whether it be books, rides, movies, you name it, and I try to give you answers to the best of my ability. I'm here with my little Epcot crew. We're here at um, Epcot on MC Magic, the one-to-one -one scale recreation of Walt Disney World, and we're going to walk around Epcot a bit while uh, we talk Disney. So, uh, without further ado, let's just jump right in and start answering some questions. So the first question this week comes from Regine Cesare? I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. I'm really awful at pronouncing names, so it's very possible I'm not. Uh, last week I talked about the history of River Country a little bit, and this question is, do you think they will replace River Country or reopen it, and why don't they reopen the slides and pools? So, uh, like I mentioned last week, the most realistic reason for why they closed River Country was more business reasons, whether it was the attendance was low or it wasn't generating them the money that they needed to generate to justify keeping it open. So for that reason alone, I don't see them reopening it anytime soon. Now, replacing it's, of course, an option. They've got that property there. They could take out the water park and put something else. Uh, if you look at Disney property, they've got, you know, Blizzard Beach and Typhoon Lagoon. There's really no pressing need for a third water park so I don't think you're ever going to see them reopen it and I don't think you're going to see them replace it with another uh, water park but you know never say never when it comes to the idea of you know taking it out and putting something completely different in I don't think there are any plans or anything rumored in that uh, regard but uh, who knows maybe in the future but as a water park I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon let's go in here you know there used to be a really cool I think it's over here there was a great art store and I really regret the last time I was at Disney not picking up a couple of pieces of art that I really wanted. Yeah, it's right here. Oh, I need to go back. I always need to go back to Disney. Anyway, our next question, uh, oh, comes from Disney World Genius, who asks, do you have recommendations for good Disney books? Uh, last week, I sort of touched upon books regarding Eisner. But yeah, there are some other great books out there. I actually have a bunch next to me. So the ones last week that I suggested, the one that I suggested the most was Disney War by James Stewart. I think it was a great look at Disney during the 90s era and Eisner bringing that company from, you know, the small Walt Disney company to like the, the massive, you know, uh, multi-million dollar behemoth it is today. Um, but there's some other great stuff out there. So of course, there's Walt Disney and American Original by Bob Thomas, which is... I think considered the definitive Walt Disney biography. Uh, he also built a <laughs> built a. He also wrote a biography for his brother Roy Disney called "Building a Company: Roy Disney and the Creation of an Entertainment Empire." And it's really interesting because you know on the earlier parts of life you get a lot of the same um, because Walt and Roy lived together; they were brothers. Uh, but once it gets to the business side, it's an interesting look at sort of the early Disney years from a business perspective as opposed to like Walt, where it was more of like a, a creative perspective. And that was sort of the the dynamic that Walt and Roy had when they were running the company. And it, it's, it's interesting to get both sides of that uh, story. There's Reality Land by David Koenig. Uh, this is a... I think it's an unofficial book, but it is essentially the story of the building of Walt Disney World. Uh, and it actually goes from, you know, Walt coming up with the idea of this city and, and you know, Project Future, Project Florida. And it goes up until, I think, the Animal Kingdom opening. But, you know, it's not split very evenly. The majority of the book is up until, you know, opening day of the Magic Kingdom. And then it sort of goes into Epcot and Hollywood Studios and stuff. And it's really interesting because it just talks about the construction of Walt Disney World uh, earlier on, the first stages. And that's really interesting because at that point, that was probably the largest private construction project in the country. So it was very interesting. And because it's an unofficial book, it's not a very, like, cleaned up version of the story. There's a... Um, they talk a lot about the problems that they ran into, whether it was through like unions and, you know, construction people stealing stuff. So it really takes an interesting look at, at what it took to build all of this stuff. And uh, that's actually one of the few books I'll read on multiple occasions just so uh, I could get a refresher and because it's just told really well. Although I'll say this much, I think David, the author, sort of has um, a grudge against Eisner and that sort of new style of of Disney because as the book goes on beyond Epcot, it seems like he gets very hypercritical of, of Disney beyond that point, uh, which I think is a shame because I don't think it's very deserving of that sort of criticism. 
Anyway, two other books I could suggest are Spinning Disney World, Spinning Disney's World by Charles Ridgway, and it is the memories of a Magic Kingdom press agent, uh, and that's also really good. Um, I want to say that's the one that is very, um, uh, also very uncleaned up. Are we going back out? Yeah, we're going out the line. We're gonna go out. We're gonna. We're not gonna ride the ride. Um, but yeah, it's it's the story of, of Charles Ridgway, this press agent. And then there's In Service to the Mouse by Jack Lindquist. Um, and it's called My Unexpected Journey to Becoming Disneyland's First President. So they're both memoirs of people from the old Disney guard. Um, really cool because even though they were on the inside working for Disney, it's not like Reality Land where it's somebody who studied this. Um, they still, because they are no longer part of the company... They don't really have any reservations about telling it how it is as opposed to keeping it cleaned up for the Disney image. So it's a cool way to look into that. And then there are books like uh, Ke uh, Keys to the Kingdom, which is more like a shorter version of what would be Disney War. It's about Michael Eisner and his time at um, the Walt Disney Company. Uh, so those are like the main books I would suggest. Great question, though. I always love talking about those books because these are the ones that I'm reading all the time to try and, you know, learn more about the company beyond just visiting and learning through experience. Our next question comes from Xcore Technology, who says, I was wondering, with all the new pirate movies and excitement about the new movies coming up, will Disney update the pirate rides with the new tech and models, or will they keep the classic models? Great job on your videos. So they already kind of did this. After the first trilogy, or, you know, the Pirates trilogy became really big, they refurbished it a bit and they added um, not only Jack to, Captain Jack Sparrow uh, towards the end of the ride, but they added uh, Blackbeard towards the beginning, and he didn't pop into the story until, I want to say, wasn't that fourth? Was the third or fourth movie? I've sort of lo lost track over who's in what. Um, so they've already sort of done a little upgrade uh, thanks to the movies. So I don't think they're going to do another one. And if they do, I think it'll be very minor additions. Maybe if there's a particularly memorable new character, maybe they'll find a way to squeeze them in. But I don't think they're going to, like, take out all of the old classic animatronics and, and replace them. I think Disney is very um, aware that that's part of what the ride's charm is. You know, uh, it's part of what makes it memorable and going to. At this point, I mean, you're getting to the, the point in the theme park's history where people are going on these rides not only because they're fun and entertaining, but they have historical value to them. You know, it's a small world by all accounts. If that was a ride that never existed and opened up today, it would probably not do very well. It probably wouldn't be a very exciting ride. It's, it's very simple. It's not very technically advanced. It's... It's sort of uh, got a very peachy, you know, uh, mood to it that you don't see a lot when it comes to new things. Like, think of, like, the new Test Track or, you know, something that's a little more edgier. Um, but it is still popular because it's got that history behind it. Somebody's hungry. All right, they're taken care of. Great. <laughs> uh so I think they would, they're going to be very careful whenever they touch something like a Pirates or a Haunted Mansion or anything like that. That's very, you know, classically beloved uh, because they don't want to ruin that for people. Uh, next question comes from Jordan Mann who asks, you said you would like a movie based off of a ride. So what would you like to see in a Space Mountain movie? That's a great question. And I don't want to get too far into it because it's just sort of like, this is it's more just my personal opinion, but... You know, for me, going on Space Mountain, I remember when it was, like, uh, sponsored by FedEx, and it just had this post-show of shipping things around the galaxy, and uh, for all I know, I never really paid attention to the pre-show, but that felt like, because of the post-show, that that's what I was always doing. It was like, oh, I'm we're shipping stuff around the galaxy, and that's what Space Mountain is. We're crazy, we're going all over with these packages. So I would like, I wouldn't mind maybe, like, a movie, a comedic movie about... You know, some really funny delivery man who, you know, is delivering packages across the galaxy and maybe gets pulled into some crazy adventure. You know, I would want it to be very lighthearted. Uh, I would love it to stylistically be very um, Tomorrowland-esque in that it's, you know, futuristic, but it's got a very 1950s Norman Rockwell style to it. Very, uh, I think, googie architecture is a similar uh, architectural style. Uh-oh, you're hungry. And he's a Kerbal! He's a Kerbal Space Program guy. There you go. That's an awesome skin. <laughs> um, 
Now let's go around some World Showcase. So that's what I'd like to see on it. Something lighthearted, something with that Knights Tomorrowland aesthetic feel to it, and uh, something funny. And I wouldn't mind if it was like live action or animated. Both would be fine with me. Uh, our next question comes from Joseph Bakerbacker. That's a cool last name, Bakerbacker. Hey Rob, Disney is one of the largest corporations in the state, only behind the Federal Reserve, I think. They own almost half of everything you do in your life, from watching TV to buying food. Do you think Disney's influence will keep expanding until the company controls most of modern life, or do you think otherwise? Thanks. So that's actually not entirely true. So uh, the Walt Disney Company is a pretty big company. I mean, to you and me, the numbers that I'm about to spout off are super big numbers. But uh, in, in relevance to like other companies in the country, the Disney Company's not that much, that, not that big. Uh, for instance, if you want to look at revenue, the Walt Disney Company brought in, I think last year, what was it, $45 billion of revenue. That's a lot of money. You and I will never be able to fully comprehend <laughs> the amount of, you know, $45 billion. But as far as, like, top companies go, that's not a whole lot. You know, the top company is Walmart. They pulled in, I think, that same year, $476 billion. Now, if you go down that whole list, you get to like number 50, number 60, that's still companies making about $100 billion, which is almost over double of what Walt Disney Company is bringing in. So in terms of revenue, the Walt Disney Company is not nearly close to being the largest. Now, if you talk about like employees, also not really uh, mostly the largest. For instance, the Walt Disney Company employs uh, 175,000 people. That's a ton of people. Again, for you and me, that number is huge. Um... But, however, if you go ahead and you look at the real, like, top companies in terms of people, like, you have 2.1 million people working at Walmart. That's just multitudes more uh, employees than something like Disney. Uh, even if you go down that list again, McDonald's, 440,000 employees. That's still, you know, roughly twice as many people as the Walt Disney Company. If you think about it, those sort of retailers... It makes sense. There are a lot of McDonald's. There are a lot of Walmarts out there. Um, I think the reason we think of Disney as a much larger company than it is is because a lot of what they do is outward facing. It's entertainment industry. We see their movies, their TV shows, the music. And so in our minds, you know, it occupies a much larger piece of the pie than something like Walmart, where a lot of those 2.1 million employees might be working behind the scenes. We never hear about them or see about them and, and things like that. Uh, that said, there's still an argument to be had about Disney's range of influence. You know, it's something there's there's vertical and horizontal integration. And the idea of horizontal is, well, OK, we make movies, we make TV shows, we make radio. But then there's vertical, which is to say, like, well, we make movies we, you know, run the casting company and we also run the production company and we also run the distribution company. And there are benefits to all of that, right? There's there's an argument in favor of uh, vertical integration, which is that you can make things cheaper and so you could do things better. But there's also an argument against it, which is to say that, well, if you have less, if you're working with less companies, there's less competition involved and that could be very bad for the consumer because at the end of the day, you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, them going with somebody else. You know, maybe Disney's not the best at distributing movies. I don't know if that's actually true. I don't know the details of that company, but let's say they're not the best. Well, the fact that, you know, if, if you didn't have that integration and they were working with a company who wasn't the best, they could go with a better company. Um, but if it's them, they don't have to, they don't care. They don't need to care because they it's their own company. You know, they don't have to answer to anybody else. They have their own business going on. So uh, it's a it's a touchy subject. It's a it's a really tricky subject. Uh, unfortunately, it's not one with a very simple answer of uh, yes, it's good or yes, it's bad. They all have their pros and their cons. So it's really a matter of looking at all and seeing how it, how it goes. Now, I, I mean, with Disney, I think there are a lot of pros to it. I love their movies. I love their parks. I love... All of the products they put out, for the most part, they have like a very, um, they have a very big pride in the quality of what they put out. Now that said, I can think of things to criticize the company about. I certainly think that they could um, treat their employees of the theme parks a lot better, or their employees in general, and pay a lot more. You know, um, I think they could do more in that regards, and um, hopefully one day they do. And it's not one of those 
like black and white issues where just because they do one thing, you know, subpar or not as good, that the company's bad or evil or anything like that. It's just every company's going to have uh, room for growth and improvement, and every company's going to do some things right and some things wrong, and it's just a matter of uh, where that balance is. Uh, fantastic question, though. It's always interesting to look at things like the Disney Company in that sort of light. I'm going to show you guys a parkour trick here. I hope I don't get in trouble for showing you this. But I do this in Italy all the time when I'm in Italy. Ready? So you could go up these stairs, right? Shh, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. And you can hop onto the tree, which brings you to this roof. And then if you if you burst jump, boom, now I'm on top of the, this thing in Italy. Look, they're all learning how to do it. Oh, I just taught them how to do that. There you go. Okay, moving on to the next question. Um, Javi, Yavi, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Uh, Luvano asks, Hey Rob, first I'd like to thank you so much for answering my question. Secondly, during the 2014 Billboard Music Awards, Michael Jackson performed a new song using the technology of holograms. Do you think we could ever see something like this with Walt Disney in the parks? Thanks and have a wonderful day. Great question. Uh, it made me look it up because I knew about, like, the Tupac hologram performance at Coachella. I didn't know about Michael Jackson's, but uh, I guess it goes to show you that this is sort of a technology that's picking up. So the, if you don't know what this is, is uh, Michael Jackson, Tupac, they're both deceased musicians, but they took um, either, like, a mix of old footage or they, like, created new footage with CGI, and they created, like, this sort of faux hologram performance that would be on stage of of this person performing a song and here's the thing the reason it works and if you if you've ever been there in person i haven't but i can you could sort of put it together but um if you're in person you're far away from it uh it's back on a stage it kind of sells the effect a lot better than if you zoom in look if you look at the video of like the tupac or the michael jackson performance whenever it gets close it looks weird it looks like cg it doesn't look realistic it doesn't look very good to be honest um and it needs a lot of work in that regards but the technology to be fair was made for people who are there uh now could you do that with walt and could you do it in disney I guess technically, like on a technical level, sure, you could. There's nothing to stop it. Will it look good? I don't know if that's the case. Because you have to consider Michael Jackson died, relatively speaking, very uh, a very short time ago. It was only a couple of years. Uh, Tupac died in the 90s. Um, so there's a lot to work with in terms of footage when it comes to high resolution or, or good quality footage. Now, Walt, he died in the 60s. Uh, a lot of what we see is of like grainy film. It's most of it's black and white. There's some stuff in color, but the stuff that isn't color is again, it's old decades old film. So that'll reduce how much you can use it uh, for something like a hologram where the idea is you want to sell like this really realistic effect. Uh, you could do some sort of CG, but you know, we just don't have the technology to make the CG look that good that it'll sell as a real person. Uh, now, if they were far away, maybe you could pull off something like that. I'm not sure in one context we would do something like that. Um, maybe on a stage in front of the Magic Kingdom in a show, something like that. Uh, there's also a lot of uh, moral questions about the morality of doing this, something like this. You know, these are people who are no longer with us and no longer can speak out about whether or not they want their image used for that. Uh, for instance, what if for some weird reason that I'm just totally making up, Michael Jackson was super against the Billboard Awards. Well, wouldn't it have been wrong to have him put on a show posthumously uh, at the awards that he dislikes? So there's a lot of discussion, and, and there's sort of been a lot of talk about using this sort of technology to put deceased actors in commercials and movies, and it's the same thing. It's like, well... You know, especially commercials, because there isn't even a lot of artistic integrity there. Are you going to take a, a dead performer and put them in there when they have no way of, you know, uh, proving of it? I believe Bruce Lee was the great example. He was in, like, a commercial. They, like, put his, superimposed his head on a, another person's body. And there was a lot of talk about, like, well, but Bruce Lee have wanted this, and do you respect that right? Uh, so I don't even know if it'd be a good thing to touch upon or try. Uh, I think there's a plenty of footage out there of Walt that he did put, make and that he willingly made that we could use to turn to him that I think we don't really need to think about that for a while and try it out. So, you know, possible, sure. Uh, it's, a, it's a big question of could we? Yes. Should we? I don't know. Maybe. We'll have, that's a discussion to have, though. 
Uh, our next question comes from Dalton Beecher, and I'm setting myself up for a trap for asking this without knowing the answer right away. What is your favorite Disney rumor out of all of them, which you like the most? River Country, Ghost, Tunnels, etc.? Thanks. What is my favorite Disney rumor? Now, I'm going to assume that by picking a favorite Disney rumor, I'm picking one that I know is not true. Now, there's a lot of rumors about, like, oh, this ride's going to close, this ride's going to be replaced with something else, and uh, that's, uh, that's uh, I don't know, that's tough. Because I'm so interested in learning the truth behind the rumors that it's hard for me to, like, have a favorite rumor. I guess there are a lot of rumors, and here's the thing, I think a lot of the rumors that I, I think about aren't actually rumors. Like, I know there have been reported cases of people trying to spread ashes of, like, loved ones at the Haunted Mansion. That's not a rumor. Um, I think that's a thing that's actually happened. Uh, but I don't know if that would be, like, the favorite, uh... I don't know. I don't have. I don't think I have a favorite rumor. Uh, like then there are other rumors that I know about that I don't like at all. Like the one that the rumor of the River Country closing because of the brain eating parasite. Like that's sort of a weird rumor. I'm not a big fan of that rumor. Uh, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I'd like the legends more than the rumors. I like the the, the little stories that you know. You know, think about the utilidors, right? Okay, the tunnels, they exist. Uh-oh, now I'm the hungry one. Eat some chicken. Uh, the utilidors exist, and we know why they exist and why Walt came up with the idea. But I really like the legend that he was just sort of hanging out at the park, and he saw a cowboy walking through Tomorrowland, and that, like, completely angered him and, and sort of threw him off, and, and that's where he got the idea for the utilidors. Is that true? Uh, I mean, it's been repeated so many times that I think it is, but I don't... I, at something like that's really hard to source. So I like those sort of legends where, you know, things like that go on. And that goes beyond um, just Disney. You know, my other favorite sort of company legend is there's a story about Steve Jobs when they were making the first iPod and how he was upset at how big the prototype iPod was. And he says it needs to be smaller. And um, the designers are like, we can't. We can't make this any smaller. And reportedly what he did was he took the iPod, walked over to this aquarium in the office, and dropped it in. And it sunk to the bottom, and he pointed at it, and he said, see these little bubbles? And the little bubbles were coming out of the cracks of the prototype that they had just spent so many hours working on. And he goes, that means there's more room in there. Make it smaller. And did that happen? I don't know if that was true or not. I kind of remember that from the biography by Walter Isaacson. But like, just like stories like that are really fascinating to me because there's such small moments that lead to such grand and large changes in whether it's the course of a, a company or just a person's history. And those are what's really fun to me. Uh, next question comes from Luke Foster, who asks, Hi, Rob. I wondered if animated movies cost more than movies that include a set and actors and actresses. Thanks, and may all your dreams come true. I thank you. Uh, yes, they do. On average, animated films cost more than live action. Uh, a lot of that is because you have to pay people a lot longer. You know, when you get an actor, a typical movie will shoot over like a month or two. If it's a really big movie, maybe three months. So that's a crew that you need to pay and have on set for a couple of months. And then you have... Uh, post-production for a couple of months, and a movie in general that's not like this big epic, you could probably get out in a year, year and a half. Animated films, quite different. It'll take multiple years, takes a lot of people. You know, Pixar might have up to 500 animators that need a yearly salary that they're gonna work on for multiple years. That money adds up, and then the tech adds up, and the art, and it's just, by being a longer process means that you're gonna pay more money. Now, one misconception is that CGI animated films cost more than hand-drawn animated films, when in reality, they're about the same. It's, in the world of entertainment, pretty negligible. It, it's not a big difference, uh, but both of them, when compared to live-action films, uh, are, are way, way more expensive. And this is actually something Walt got into live action because of, you know, he was getting a little frustrated with how long it would take to work on an animated film, how many change you'd have to throw in. Compared to live action, when he would put a movie together, you could do that, especially in the studio days where they were really pumping them out like clockwork. You get a movie out in well under a year and it was a lot cheaper, a lot faster, and you still had those ideas. Hey, Lib's around. Hey, Lib, I like the princess. Uh, Princess Crown. Um, so yeah, way, way cheaper to make live action, and that's part of the reason why. Personally speaking, here's a little Rob story. It's how I got into film. 
Uh, when I was in the eighth grade, I got really into claymation and animation, and it was a lot of fun, but it took a long time to put those together, um, a lot of effort for a very short clip. And so eventually I tried doing stuff with a camera and I realized how much faster I could make a video with with that and so I sort of got into filmmaking that way and from the eighth to ninth grade all the way up until the end of college like film was what I was going to do with my life and I wanted to be a director and I still I guess to my point a little bit I mean I have my own reasons that's another that's another talk for another video as to why I ended up getting out of film but uh, as you can see obviously by making all of these videos I still really love making media uh it's a lot of fun. All right, let's get some lightning round. Oh, I only think I have one question left. Look at that. Okay, our last question this week comes from Noe Infanti. Noe Infanti? Inf infant? It's like kind of like infinity, but it's not spelt like infinity. Uh, is there a room in the Cinderella Castle in Disney World? Yep, there's a suite. Uh, during a like a year of a thousand wishes or a year of a million wishes promotion, they were actually. It was, it's, there was a suite in there that you could spend the night in, but the, the idea is, uh, at least originally, you could not buy it. There was no price, there was no talking or pulling any strings to get it. They, it was purely a prize that they would give away, and a family would be able to spend the night in Cinderella's castle. Uh, I believe the original plan, and this, I guess, is one of those stories, was that it was going to be an apartment for the Disney family, but, of, of course, unfortunately, Walt passed away, uh, and then for a long time, it was like an operator's office where, you know, this was back in the day when you had telephones, you had to have operators who were crossing the lines to make sure that these calls were getting connected. And that's what it was used for. And then for a long time, it was just sort of closed off and it was nothing. And then they took it and they renovated it, turned it into a suite. I don't know what they're doing with it now, if they're still giving away like daily or nightly stays to families. But uh, that's what they were doing for quite a while. Anyway, I want to thank you all. Um, this was another great batch of Q&A questions. If you want to ask a question for me to answer, uh, just leave it in the comments below on YouTube. Um, you can, if I, I try to get to as many as I can. If, I, if it's a new question, a really cool thought-provoking question, I try to get to it in the video. If it's something I've answered before, I'll try to just answer it in the comments. Uh, I do my best to get to all of them. Anyway, if you want to follow me on Twitter and ask a more immediate question, it's at Rob Plays. Uh, I'm also on Facebook and Instagram at Rob Plays That Game. Uh, but more, impos more importantly, if you want to help out the channel, the best thing you could do to help out the channel is just tell a friend. Maybe they uh, will enjoy the videos as much as you do. Anyway, thanks for watching, everybody. Have a fantastic week. Whatever you're doing, put the most into it. Make the most out of it. It'll make it so much better than it could otherwise be. And I hope to see you all next time. And maybe, hey, I tweet out you know, on Twitter when I'm recording. That's Lib popped up because he probably saw my tweet. You guys can run around and be my little, my little theme park crew when we run around and do these. Anyway, have a great week, everybody, and I will see you next time for the next episode of the Walt Disney World Q&A. Bye, everybody.